It's been over a week now since the Creative Assembly released the latest DLC for Rome 2, Hannibal at the Gates, giving me plenty of time to get to grips with all it has to offer. As with my previous reviews, I will not be scoring the DLC, but rather just show you what you'll be getting in the DLC pack and the positives and negatives surrounding it, allowing you to make your own mind up whether or not it's worth a purchase. So let's get right into it. Straight off the bat, you'll notice your home screen has changed to a lovely western Mediterranean map with the Hannibal at the Gates Crescent in the center draped in a deep and powerful purple. This of course can be turned off with mods if you don't like it. This is present in the base game, which is an obnoxious way of advertising to you that you don't own the DLC, but if you do, it looks quite nice. Before showing you the factions, first I thought I'd explain the premise. Hannibal at the Gates, much like the previous Caesar and Gaul DLC, creates a historical scenario and focuses solely on that period of time, that being the Second Punic War of 218 BC. In this tumultuous period, the Western Mediterranean was catapulted into a massive war between two superpowers, Carthage and Rome, over the course of 17 years in a tug-of-war battle for territory and the right to rule the Mediterranean in what would be some of history's most brilliant and costly battles. The campaign begins right after the Siege of Saguntum, which was the linchpin for the breakdown of diplomatic relations between Rome and Carthage and all at war. Have a choice. I choose war. Upon selecting the new Hannibal at the Gates campaign, you will be greeted with five playable factions. Carthage, controlling much of the North African coast and some of Western Iberia, your forces are spread thin and you will have to pacify the tribes around you, either through diplomacy or conquest, allowing you to essentially secure your flanks before you can make the long march toward Italy. Rome, controlling a mass of 15 settlements with four client states across a disjointed and twisted Italy, have their hands full with just four armies and must rely heavily on diplomacy and trust that their Samnite allies and Etruscans can defend a largely unoccupied Italy. Syracuse, the child torn between its arguing parents, sits alone in Sicily with just one settlement, and can either use its client state status with Rome to its advantage, embarking across the Mediterranean to Carthaginian soil, or rebel against them, hoping to gain favour with Rome's enemies and finally capturing Sicily for themselves. The Lusitani, starting on the edge of the world, are in a prime position to either befriend the Carthaginians and aid their advance north whilst capturing most of central Iberia, or be a thorn in their side, hampering the advancements of the invaders of Iberia and liberating the tribes of their same blood. The first of the new additions to the Rome 2 roster, the Lusitani's lineup of units is largely underwhelming and samey as the other tribes in the Iberia region and southern Gaul. Most notable, however, is the Lusitani guerrillas, which are a very effective spear-wielding stealth unit. This unit can actually be deployed outside of your own deployment zone, placing them pretty much anywhere on the map except for the enemy's deployment zone. And finally, the Aravasi, another Iberian tribe similar to the Lusitani with equal opportunities. You can attack Carthage, attack Rome, or ally with the other Iberians and attack both. Starting in the heart of Iberia, the Aravasi are much the same as the other Iberian tribes and have a similar roster, except for their unique painted warriors, which instill fear in the enemy because they are painted weird and apparently smell really bad. Rome and Syracuse have got a buff in their rosters a tad, adding new units, auxiliary Iberian cavalry, picked hoplites, mercenary Etruscans and Samnites, and some new mercenaries have been added also in Iberia. Also new is obviously the focus map, which spans from the western tip of Spain across to the Mediterranean to Tarentum in Italy. The map is quite diverse, with tight and narrow pathways in Italy to vast open and hilly countryside in Iberia. However, about 50% of the map is water, and there is very little focus on naval combat, with only about 5 technology upgrades reserved for your navy and ports. I feel this is a bit of a missed opportunity for Creative Assembly, especially since Sy Syracuse has had a very famous siege in 218 BC, in which Archimedes invented several contraptions to hamper Roman efforts in the harbour. Such inventions were as crazy as a giant claw that lifted ships out of the water, mirrors that burned sails, and a special ballista that fired fire from the walls to the sea. I never thought we would see that, but hey, after the Beasts of War, it'd be cool to see something weird and radical that people actually enjoy. Aside from that, the map does look very detailed and really immerses you in the world, I feel. Couple this with the seasonal effects and you really get a truly beautiful campaign. However, seasons in the game don't play as important as a role as they did in Caesar and Gaul, due to the climate not creating winter attrition often, taken away from that risk-reward element of catching your enemies off guard during the winter. Another oversight, or possibly just laziness again, is the same issue that cropped up in Caesar and Gaul, the technology tree. 
On one side, we have the usual military trees, management, tactics, and siege, which all do the same things you'd expect, like upgrade buildings, units, and bonuses. On the other side, however, we have civil, which includes diplomacy, laws, and improvements. I want you to think about that for a second. How diplomacy is a technology. Does it make sense to you? We have a diplomacy screen, so why do we have to unlock diplomacy as a technology with other factions? Well, what you are unlocking is basically points to make other factions like you more depending on your culture. Also, for diplomacy, you are paying for each upgrade to unlock over time, unlike all the other ones which unlock over time without money. So I try to think of what the scenario is, to make it semi-realistic and fun. Maybe I'm paying for a bribe that takes time to exchange hands or something. This is unlikely as the first tech is diplomats, which just doesn't really make any sense. Yes, before 218 BC, we never had diplomats. It's a technology that must be, must be researched and unlocked. I don't know, but again, it just seems like this is forced under technology because it's more convenient than creating new menus or something for it. No aspect of diplomacy should be technology, in my opinion. Nor should politics in Caesar and Gaul. Damn it, Creative Assembly, I thought you watched my last review. That is the makeup of the tech trees for Rome and Carthage, however the Lusitani and the Aravasi tribes have a different, more traditional style of tech tree with the civil branch containing tribal economy and tribal council, and the military branch containing warrior code and war exercises, which are more akin to the main Rome exper experience. Syracuse similarly has pretty much the same tech tree as other Greek states. The campaign does focus more on Carthage and Rome, giving both factions specific missions that help recreate the history surrounding the events of the war. These are interesting missions and of course are optional, but offer heavy financial bonus which makes them extremely tempting. Unfortunately, Hannibal himself and Scipio do not have special abilities as Caesar in Gaul did, making them feel a little bit more hollow as generals. However, it's still epic to pitch these generals against each other as neither one will die until their faction is destroyed, instead being rendered wounded if they lose a battle. Another welcome addition is the new Dilemma system. I'm not sure if they are scripted or not, but they offer the chance to make a nationwide choice, like focusing on military for a few years for just a small benefit. They usually have no costs associated with them and seemingly randomly just appear. I actually quite liked this feature, but it might be better if it wasn't a temporary buff, but instead you could actually focus the government on military spending or something. But I guess that's basically what choosing a tech is. One weird one was something like you can either A, focus on a harvest or something, for 25% food, I think, or B, not do that and get minus 25% food. So who on earth makes the second choice? Hopefully that one was a bug as I've never seen such a stupid question presented. Overall though, I do actually like these messages that allow you to shift the focus a little bit, even though it does feel like it takes the control away from you in, in some particular way. This is about it for all the campaign additions. In terms of battles, we have two new historical battles, the Battle of Zama and the Battle of Cannae. Both extremely important battles that I feel are fun, but ultimately fall short of the spectacle it must have been at the time. The Caesar and Gaul Elysia battle was much more interesting to me personally, and had an impressive rendition of Elysia and Caesar's siege works. I'll be doing a playthrough on Legendary of each battle in case you want to see how it's done, and also learn a little bit about what really happened. The battles themselves in the game are the same as they are in the base game, so there's really no need to cover that. However, I feel the AI has come a long way and there is much more of a challenging aspect to it now than there ever was. Settlement battles are still the crutch of the game, which seems like it'll never be overcome at this stage. However, land battles are thoroughly enjoyable. When I think about it, the review, this review does sound quite negative, but I want to stress that I've found this campaign fun even with my limited time with it. Having two larger nations fight it out changes the entire dynamic of the campaign and makes it much more interesting to see how it plays out. I never thought I'd appreciate a smaller campaign more than the Grand Campaign, but Caesar and Gaul proved to me that a more focused historical scenario makes for much more interesting gameplay and Hannibal at the Gates delivers on that same premise. I do enjoy the epic scale of the Grand Campaign, but it's rare that you ever see large portions of the map unless you are solely setting out to own everything. The slower turn time at 12 turns per year also allows you to become more attached to your armies and generals, ranking them up and even allowing you to become accustomed to the enemy's generals, somewhat. The multiplayer campaign, while I haven't played it, features the full list of playable factions of the single player campaign, unlike Caesar and Gaul which didn't allow for a multiplayer campaign as Rome. I can imagine going head to head with a buddy at Carthage v Rome would be a pretty fun game. 
That's all for me guys, I hope you enjoyed this review. If you picked up the game, let me know what you think of it in the comments below and tell me if I missed anything. For those who've asked me to do a let's play of it, I won't be doing this, uh, at least not anytime soon, so check out Legend of Total War's channel as he has done a playthrough of Syracuse on Legendary Difficulty that's both funny and showcases some great battles. Lastly, check out my Twitter and Facebook and stay tuned for my Legendary Battles for Hannibal at the Gates coming up in the next few days.